we're going to talk about DAOs today. Uh, a few years ago, if we were talking about DAOs, people were talking that, were thinking that, you know, you would just put money into them and your money would magically disappear because of the whole the DAO hack. Um, but back in the day, you know, we were like, well, DAOs are not inherently bad, so let's, let's focus on them. Let's actually make them great. Um, the DAO was unfortunate, but it also pushed the space forward by a lot in terms of security. Um, and so uh, that's what we are doing at Aragon. We've been doing DAOs since November 2016, and uh, focusing on making them very high quality and very easy to use for anywhere in the world. So what I want to talk about today is how we can use DAOs to make decentralized protocols actually decentralized. So um, I don't know if I coined this term, but I like to use the term CFI. So probably you all know DeFi, decentralized finance. Um, but actually, there's another term called CFI, which is uh, centralized finance. And uh, a lot of this DeFi that we talk about today is actually CFI, uh, which, I mean, I will talk about that later, but I think it's, um, it's okay sometimes uh, to start centralized and then decentralized, but we just have to be conscious about it and make a conscious effort to actually get uh, uh, for it to be decentralized. And so I want to talk about um, some things today, starting with you know, smart contracts, the best invention since ramen. I think we will all agree. Immutable smart contracts are the default state of smart contracts, at least on blockchains like Ethereum. And so they are fully trustless, so call this law kind of thing. Uh, what you write into the smart contract is basically what happens. And, but the issue is they are not upgradable. And so we learned the hard way uh, via kind of, you know, some, some other issues that we had in the Ethereum community that it is very important for smart contracts to be upgradable for mainly two reasons. One of them is you want to be able to fix bugs, and the other one is you want to be able to add features. It is very hard to compete against um, other systems that are upgradable and enhanced over time if we don't have that capability or if the only way to upgrade something is via forks, which, which require a lot of human coordination. So each time you want to add something, you have to tell your whole network, hey, I deployed a new contract, this is the new address, and uh, you know, they have to like, review it again, and they have to reach consensus again that that new contract is the one that they should actually use. And you lose a lot of network effects as well. If you want to fork every time that you want to upgrade a contract, that may just break, for example, like, you know, a lot of DeFi protocols because you just cannot be like, yeah, this is V2 and you have to move all your funds from one place to the other. Imagine like all of that if people were like closing CDPs uh, in like, you know, one system and opening in the other one, um, that would just break everything. Then on the other hand, we have the centrally governed smart contracts. That's easy for developers, right? You have a smart contract and then you just upgrade it and that's it. But it is not really trustless. Um, because it is custodial, so you have funds and then you have unilateral permission to upgrade the smart contract. What is the difference with just having a centralized server in which you can like push code to? And so I like to use the, uh, the Ether Trump um, analogy here. I, uh, I made this kind of picture with like Ethereum's logo and, and Trump because I think this is, the, this is the worst from both worlds. You have like uh, Ethereum, which is, you know, like kind of clunky to use and slow and all of those things and, and it costs money to like click buttons as one team member from our team said. Um, but then also you have the worst things from like, you know, it being centralized. So there is one person, one sort of like dictator or entity that can just push changes, right? So I think centrally governed smart contracts are just a very bad idea. Um, so that's why the, the Ether Trump, I hope you, you don't have nightmares about the Ether Trump. Uh, and, and thanks John for coining the term Ether Trump. I, I love it. Um, and now, well, what I want to propose is a different thing, which is a different combination that I think takes the best from both worlds, and that is community-governed smart contracts. And so the idea for, for these smart contracts is that they are upgradable, you can enhance them over time, you can enhance your protocol, you can enhance your apps, but at the same time, there's a community, there's a governance process, a legitimate governance process uh, that ensures that you just cannot push an update uh, that you know gets all people's money and get away with it, right? And so, I think this is very, very important to to work on. And the issue here is, of course, you have to figure out your governance structure. You have to think, all right, if I am going to put my smart contracts governance behind a DAO or some sort of like community governance, what is the governance structure that fits the best? And so, we've been working with projects uh, for a long time to figure this out, and there are a bunch of different things you can do. The cool thing about Aragon and the way we thought about it is that it is very modular. 
So instead of saying, you know, we have like the key ingredient, like the key solution that is gonna solve all your governance problems and we're gonna use focus on that. Instead of saying that, we were like, well, we don't know how organizations of the future are gonna look like. We don't know, you know, in the future, which kind of DAOs people will want to deploy. We think every protocol has, or, or each community even, has their own needs. And so let's build this very modular framework in which you can basically do everything that is here and much more. So there are two axes in this, uh, in this kind of map here. And so one of them is speed. So the speed at which developers, core developers, can implement changes to the protocol. And there's the other one, which is trustlessness, which is how trustless is actually this protocol. The reason why trustlessness is important is not because I like decentralization, which I also do. Um, it's more because if it's not trustless, again, like if you just have like a protocol that is custodial, you may have a lot of issues from not having trust from your users because you can just withdraw their funds or you know, maliciously uh, inter like intervene in their apps and, and the working systems. Or even because you may have legal, legal issues. Like a, lo a lot of these um, CFI projects today, I think they may face some kind of legal issue if they are just basically the ones controlling the whole protocol in, in the background, right? So, um, because they are, they are supposed to be decentralized, but they are not in practice. So I think it is very important uh, to put trustlessness first, where we're building trustless systems. If you don't want a trustless system, you can always use MongoDB and use go the centralized route. It's gonna have amazing user experience. Um, the centralized for me has like very, very uh, high speed, but it's not trustless at all. Then you have something like a technical council. So there is um, a, a project, uh, a DeFi protocol actually, called Melon Protocol. And so the way they structure their governance, uh, they, they wanted to do something in which token holders have the ultimate word, but also there was, you know, fa fairly, uh, fairly fast to push updates, right? And so today, it is very hard to show um, token holders of your community a smart contract and be like, well, do you want to approve this upgrade? I mean, that requires a lot of coordination costs and stuff like that. And there is a very specific knowledge that they need to have on solidity and general protocol design. So instead of doing that, they wanted a technical council. So token holders could like vote for this council, and then this council would take care of the, of the upgrades afterwards. And so for me, that's, that's not like super, super trustless, but I think it's like trustless enough, and also guarantees a very high speed, because you can iterate very fast with this council, and you can ensure that these people actually know what they're talking about. They are experts in their field. So this is a very, very example of how a protocol went from centralized to decentralized using Aragon and our tooling. Um, and it's a, it's a very exciting project, and right now it's been on main for, uh, for a few months uh, in terms of the, the governance structure that they are using with Aragon, and I'm super, super happy that it's working out for them. Then you have other models, for example, community veto. So here you may say, as the core developer, I still want to retain the power to push upgrades, but I want to give my community like 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever time you want, for them to check the upgrade and be able to veto it. If it's just like outrageous, if I'm just gonna like, you know, steal their money or something like that. So with this, um, you may have this period where like you need to uh, allow token holders to vote no to your proposed upgrade. So it is not that fast, but it's more trustless, right? Because you can have your whole community basically stop updates at any point in time. So that's cool. Then you have like stuff like liquid tokenocracy. Uh, the reason I call it tokenocracy is because it is not like democracy in the sense that you have like uh, one person, one vote. You can also do that with Aragon. There is another um, DAO that is, that is doing that, uh, doing some kind of like um, civil resistance using an app that they have in which you have to like take a photo or something like that. It's a very cool system. Uh, but here I'm referring to tokenocracy. So basically, um, skin in the game kind of, uh, kind of tokenocracy where like you have one token, you have one vote basically. And so you can have something like liquid tokenocracy where you can delegate to other people so your token holders don't have to read every proposal. They can just delegate to other person that they, they think is, uh, is more expert in that, in that field. Uh, but then if that person, that delegate, is not performing well, they can withdraw their vote immediately and give it to someone else. So that's very cool. Uh, we're working on that implementation. Um, and then you have something uh, that is, I think, the, probably the most trustless, but also like kind of slow, which is direct tokenocracy. That's what we do also in, uh, in Aragon for our own governance. So each three months, token holders get to decide on the future of the project. And I think, I think that's a very cool model. Uh, it's a, again, like, it's super trustless. Like, you know, every three months, basically, they can do whatever they want. 
Uh, you don't have to do it every three months. You can do like continuous as well. But of course, if you need the other token holders to come together and take a decision, maybe it's better to like concentrate that into one moment each quarter, one moment each year kind of thing. So it's more, you know, it's slower, but it's more trustless. So again, you know, you can design all of this with Aragon, and you can basically see what are your trade-offs, what matters to you, and then you know, customize your DAO to fit those needs. So I think it is very important to build a community, not only to ensure that the protocol remains trustless, and so you can eventually move governance from centralized to decentralized, but also because if you look at like what 3 is all about, it's basically network effects around communities. The code can be forked, um, of course, like brand and stuff like that, and community cannot. So it is very, very important that we focus on the right things here, and community is the right thing. If you look at Ethereum, um, you, can, you can fork Ethereum today, you can name it Ethereum Cash, probably no one would use it because the community we have here, you guys and everyone out there, that cannot be forked. So I think also it's very important, um, as, as, I was, uh, as I was studying the other day, that we see organizations and governance structures as products, and the users, maybe in this case I was talking about like a, more like a company structure or like an organization, but I think it's the same for a crypto protocol or network. So when you create the governance structure, that is also a product. That is a product, and your users are your community members, for example. So when I think about the governance process we created for ourselves in Aragon, um, we have a lot of these people who author new governance proposals, we have these people uh, who edit them, uh, we have these people who then are community members and they get affected by them. So at the end of the day, you have to look at your community and your governance as just another product. Uh, you have to care of it as if it was just another product that you're building. So, and of course, a very important one. I think also when talking about um, one token, one vote, a lot of people get outraged about, you know, protocracy and capture and all of these things, right? I think if, if we look at tokenocracy or um, what I call the evolution of stakeholder governance, if you look at shareholder governance for the last uh, hundreds of years, it has worked beautifully to create value. Now we are in this weird position where we have common goods or something that kind of resembles a common good um, or it's like, you know, kind of a gray area between being a common good and also like a, like a private property. Because, um, I mean, it's not certainly like 100% common good. You have to like acquire ETH or Bitcoin or whatever to be part of these networks. Uh, but at the, same of the, uh, at the same time, like it's not just a traditional private company. So I think here with this evolution of stakeholder governance, one token, one vote, there are certain things that could be improved. But there are also things that are really great uh, and they are very handy if you just want to like have a community voting today. So, and service skin in the game, of course, if you have participants in your network that own a big stake or they own a stake, uh, they're going to be incentivized for the network and the community to grow and work. They are easy to deploy today, like you can deploy one token, one vote today, very, very easy. Allows for pseudonymous participants. I don't like KYC. I think it works for some models, governance models, but I think uh, allowing pseudonymous participation is very important. For example, in the Aragon community, there are people who are pseudonymous, they pass proposals into the ballot, and they actually get adopted by the whole community, and we don't know who these people are, and that's beautiful, that's the beauty of it. And then also allows everyone to benefit from value creation. So a key difference with like private companies decades ago is that um, you could only benefit from this value creation, for example, in Apple, Facebook, and stuff like that. If you were the first angel investor, the seed investor, even you know, later in the kind of like uh, stage in which you could buy shares, right? But not a lot of people had access to that, um, especially not like everyone who was not a VC. Here, everyone can just chime in and you know, buy Bitcoin early in the day or buy Ether or buy whatever kind of token or community so they can, they can participate in that value creation. So my message here is uh, only owner, I don't think it will last. Uh, we need to improve trustlessness and transparency with DAOs especially for protocols that are supposed to be decentralized. I think it's important also, if, if your protocol is centralized today, I think you know, there are some trade-offs, there are things that need to be improved, and I don't blame you. Like, technology wasn't there a year ago for these protocols to actually be more decentralized, but it is today. And so we need to like, pave the way, we need to think about the roadmap, and we need to actually get these things into a point that they are actually trustless. Um, if you get an only owner problem, we can help. We're working on uh, this one-click setup template for protocols. So if you go to um, the Aragon app, you see these templates that you can just click on and then fill like a bunch of text fields in our beautiful UI. Click create, boom, done. 
If you want to do something more complex, there are like CLI, like command line tools that are like an, there's like an SDK with a bunch of things. You can really like get crazy with it. But if you want to get like the basic, basic, basic templates, it's literally like graphic, like user interface. Like you don't have to do anything else. And we're working on integrating this uh, into our, uh, like Argon client. So in the future, you will be able to use, go to app.argon.org, select crypto protocol. And then basically you can write your smart contracts. Um, for example, here, this can be your protocol, um, like on the, on the left side of the screen. You can write your smart contracts, you know, as much uh, flexibility as you want. And then instead of like putting the only owner to your account uh, or your company's uh, share ledger or treasure or whatever, uh, what you can do is put the only owner to the agent app in the DAO. And so basically everything to the right uh, is the DAO. So the DAO can have multiple apps, the voting app, uh, the finance app that allows your DAO to have money, um, you can get very crazy with permissions. So for example, you can, uh, you can give a boarding app to get money out of the finance app. So you can even have like a protocol reward DAO in which like, you know, each block uh, or yeah, each block or like, you know, each, each period of time, there is a new um, token created that goes into this uh, finance app in the DAO. And then token holders can use the voting app to decide how to spend those funds on protocol development. Um, but then we created this app called Agent inside Argon. And Agent is basically, the, the DAO's face to the world, to the Web3 world. And so what Agent, Agent allows is for the DAO to interoperate with any Web3 protocols. So the DAO may be able to open a CDP on Maker, the DAO may be able to lend money on Compound, all of those things. And the cool thing here is you don't need to get into our SDK to use this. Like you just basically have to create your protocol whatever way you want, and then put the address of this Agent app as the only owner. And that would basically um, make your protocol be governed by a DAO. It's that easy. So um, I think as a summary, like DAOs make DeFi deserve the D. Uh, I, think, I think right now we're in the process of actually making sure that DeFi actually deserves that. I think it's more like CFI today. I think Aragon apps are very easy to deploy. You can literally deploy them in like 30 seconds. There are working case studies on mainnet, like the one that I mentioned from, uh, from Melon Protocol. If you go to the Aragon website, there's like a slideshow with multiple mainnet use cases today. Um, and we're working on this one-click setup template that will make things way, way easier. So, as I said before, like, uh, we have a bunch of DAOs now on mainnet. I think a year ago, technology was very early. I think now we're getting there. So more than 700 DAOs on mainnet today. You can create yours at app.argon.org. Very easy, it's right, like 30 seconds. We just released a new version two weeks ago or three weeks ago uh, that makes the user experience much better. I think we're getting there. Like we are, we are slowly making sure that it's comparable to Web2 experiences um, in terms of user experience. So I'm very happy about that. And I just want to thank everyone. You can follow Aragon on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter. If you are interested in these challenges, uh, the, the company that I work for, Aragon One, we're hiring a uh, bunch of roles, especially front-end people, because we really care about design and we really care about bringing these to people that actually need it. So you just go to aragon.one slash jobs. And also you can check out the Aragon website. So thanks. And I actually have uh, two more things for today. So one of them is um, Aragon is going to be releasing a couple interesting news later today about a couple community developments that are going on. So stay, stay tuned for the uh, ARA news during the day. And then a second one is we are throwing a party. And so we are throwing a, a DAO party, Daiko edition, so basically focusing on the Daiko model and the uh, upcoming launch of Aragon fundraising that will allow any DAO in the world to fundraise using bonding curves. So it's very cool. We're going to have um, we're going to have actual like sushi there uh, for the first people that arrive. Not like party finger food. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, and I invite everyone to just um, sign up. You can RSVP just going to Aragon's Twitter, and there is a link there. So. See you all later and hope we can enjoy some sushi and DAO conversations. Thank you.